Hi everyone. So I want to say good afternoon to all the boys and the girls, the young men, the young women, the parents, our pastors, our pathfinder leaders, friends, well wishers from all around the world who are here on the Zoom and on our Facebook page joining us this afternoon for our e-honors club. So I am going to be teaching you the flags honor. All right, so I'm going to bring up the PowerPoint that I've prepared for you at this time, and I'm going to share it on my screen as we walk through the honor. Now, we have quite a few. All right, is it up there, Pastor? Yes, we can see it. Wonderful. Oh, good. So we have our flags honor. So Pastor would have said that I have roots in Scotland. In Scotland. Well, I did pursue my master's at the University of Aberdeen from 2016 to 2017. So... Pastor NJ would have been my pastor while I was there, and Pastor Dean and I had the privilege of interacting a few times when we would have met at various youth functions. So, Pastor Dean, Pastor NJ, it's good to see you all again and to connect with you. Um, a little bit about me. So, let me tell you um, my name is Renee Joseph. And I am from the beautiful Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, that's in the Caribbean. So guess what, guys? It's actually 11.40 a.m. where I am now. It's 20 minutes to 12. So I just had to run across from church to be here with you. <laughs> just as divine hour was starting. So to make sure that I was here to be able to walk you through the flags on them. So I belong to the South Caribbean Conference. There's the North Caribbean Conference. But Trinidad is the South Caribbean Conference. And I grew up in the Pathfinder Club. So I became an adventurer when I got baptized. Um, that I was eight years old when I got baptized. And I preached my first sermon when I was nine years old for Pathfinder Day. So I was the adventurer and one of my other friends, there was a two-part sermon, so I preached the adventurer sermon. And my friend who was one year elder than I was, just 10 years old, she preached the Pathfinder Sermon. And that's at the Arima Seventh-day Adventist Church in here in Trinidad. Um, at present, my rank, I am a Pathfinder instructor. So that means that I am instructing the instructors who teach the Pathfinder leaders who teach you. All right? So that's the highest rank in the Pathfinder program, the PIA, the Pathfinder Instructor Award. And another fun fact and something that I am very proud of, in my Pathfinder history, I became a drill instructor in the year 2004, all right? So I would have passed out with the drill instructors program in 2004 with my conference. In 2007, I was the first female red... Hey, Rene, uh, somebody muted you. Uh, I don't know what happened there. Are you able to unmute yourself? Hey, Rene. Yes, the host muted me. <laughs> that came up on my screen. Sorry about that. Is that all right? Yeah. Wonderful. So I was saying that in 2007, I became the first regimental sergeant major elected in the South Caribbean Conference, the first female regimental sergeant major. Prior to then, all before me had been men. And so I made history in 2007 to be the first female. Now, who is the regimental sergeant major? For those of us who don't know, the regimental sergeant major is the person who is responsible for the development and teaching of drilling and marching within the conference. All right, so that was 2007. And then in 2010, I became the first female one IC. So that's the first in command, also a drill instructor. Um, but that's the highest office you can hold as a drill instructor within the Pathfinder organization. And that was because the person who is the one I see represents the Pathfinder organization at national drilling and marching events. So I sat on national drill councils um, with respect to the development of drill in my country and for all our national and civil parades. And then in 2012, I had the privilege to teach my first drill instructors course and to pass out the first batch of instructors since 2004 when I had qualified. So those are wonderful things that you can do in the club, boys and girls. And I want to encourage you to go as far as possible, enjoy and engage in your hobbies and really excel in club work because you can really become a more well-rounded person because of the Pathfinder Club. I've seen this in my own life and I wish the same for you. All right, so I'm going to proceed now. Flags honors. 
No, guys, we have 10 questions in just 55 minutes. We have 10 questions to answer, and some of these questions have multiple parts. I see somebody has raised their hand, Galaxy, Galaxy A4. Pastor, you see that hand raised there? Galaxy, somebody has raised yeah, just their hand. To do, all the questions need to go into chat, so if you have a question, just put it in the chat room, and then we're going to uh, give it to Rene, and she's going to answer it. So everybody who would like to say uh, something, please put it in the chat. All right, excellent. So we have 10 questions. So here we go. We have to one, describe what a flag is and list three uses of flags. Now I know that you all would have done the vexillology. Honor, oh, no, Pastor, Pastor NJ. Right, so I think this question would have been answered in that. So I really hope here that we are able to respond to that question. Then we have to know and locate the parts of the flag. A canton, a field, a finial, the fly stand, the fly end, the fly, the halyard, the hoist side, and the truck. Number three, know three important guidelines for the care and handling of your national flag. Number four, learn how to practice and learn how to and practice folding your national flag. Number five, we have to learn what is the proper etiquette for saluting the flag when you are in uniform while standing when you are in uniform while marching, when you are in the field uniform while you're wearing your headgear and when you are not in uniform. So that's question number five. Question number six, the Pathfinder flag. We need to know who designed it, who sewed the first Pathfinder flag. We need to draw the Pathfinder flag and know the meaning of the emblem on the Pathfinder flag. Then we have to draw the Christian flag, explain what the colors represent and know what the emblems represent. Finally, number eight, well, on this slide, know how to display the national, state, province, Christian, AY, and Pathfinder flags for each of these occasions. Campsite, when we're in special ceremonies and the flags are on the platform, when we are in other ceremonies and the flags are on the ground, when we're at a fair and we have a booth at a fair, Pathfinder booth, or in Pathfinder club meetings. Nine and 10, we have to share the history of your national flag and state what the colors and symbols represent. And then we have to identify all the flags of your division and know what countries they represent. So we have quite a lot to get through. So we're gonna dive right in. Um, Pastor, do we have any questions on the chat there? I saw the chat is lighting up a bit. Um, are they well, there are some people who wanted to know where about in the Caribbean you are from. So I didn't see anything about flags there. Uh, but <laughs> somebody has gone on to uh, uh, kindly uh, tell us um, a definition, uh, a flag being a symbol that represents uh, something. So no quite questions. I don't know on uh, Facebook, do you have anything uh, yet? Uh, All so right. not quite. Okay, so I am from Trinidad and Tobago, so that is most southerly island in the Caribbean. So when you look at the Caribbean, the Caribbean is an archipelago and it's a chain of islands. Look down to the bottom, right above Venezuela, and you'll see Trinidad there. <laughs> Trinidad and Tobago. All right, so I'm really, really far. I'm across the Atlantic from Scotland. All right, so let's jump right into it, guys. Flags. The definition of a flag. So the person who said that the flag is a symbol to represent something, they're not far off at all. All right, so we have here the definition of a flag. It is a piece of material with a distinctive design. So it can't just be a piece of cloth. No, it must have a distinctive design and it is usually rectangular in shape. There are some that are maybe triangular, all right? Um, but they are used as a symbol, as a signaling device or as decoration and they are attached to a pole or a rope. Now you see some words that are in bold there. I need you to take note of those words because when you get your worksheets, you would see why those words in bold are important. All right? So a flag, any piece of material, it has a distinctive design. It's usually rectangular in shape. And what is its purpose? It's used as a symbol, as a signaling device, or as decoration. And it's usually attached to a pole or a rope. All right? So the Pathfinder flag, for example, is a symbol of our organization. But sometimes when we go out into the bush and we become lost, we may have certain flags that we have to wave, SOS, all right? So that's a signaling device. And then sometimes some people drape flags like as a background or sometimes in a funeral, for example, you drape the casket. So that's as a decoration, all right? Just a few examples there for flags. Now let's look at this diagram here. Okay, so we'll see here 
that there are just about 10 parts of a flag. So you need to take note of them. So we have the hoist at the side, the staff ornament, also called a finial, the truck, the fly, the fly end, the canton, the field or ground, the flagpole, and the halyard. We have fly twice, okay? Because we have fly at the bottom, and then we have it at the top as well. So let's explore what these parts refer to. All right, boys and girls, so are you ready? All right, because remember, this is a part of your worksheet as well, so you want to pay attention, right? Wink, wink, all right. So let's look at them. What's the, the hoist? Now, the hoist is the height of the flag while it is flying. So from the bottom of the flag, to the top of the flag. That's the edge of the flag that is attached to the flag pole. So the bottom to the top is called the hoist, all right? Then we have the fly. So if we have the height of the flag, the fly is the length of the flag, all right? So that is the point that attaches to the flag pole straight out to the end that is flapping in the wind. So we have the hoist, by the fly, that's what makes up the fly. Or as some of us would say in a rectangle, we have the breadth by the length. So that's what it is, the hoist by the fly. Okay, so we see it here, the hoist, if we look here, where my pointer is there, the hoist from the top of the flag to the bottom, and then we have the fly going straight across the bottom here. All right, so that's the length by the breadth. Next two parts, we have the canton. No, not all flags have a canton. But the canton is the top inner corner of the flag. It is the top in the upper left-hand corner of the flag. You will find a canton. All right, can anybody name a flag that has a canton for me? A very popular country. Come on, light up the chat. Can anybody name a flag that has a canton on it? Okay, so we've got some uh, responses straight uh -huh. on, as you were just saying. Uh, but I will uh, hold back to get what those on Facebook are also on saying. Facebook, yes, because we want our Facebook viewers to be participating as well. So the exactly. British flag or the UK flag does not have a canton, but there's another really popular country that has one. They're always in the news. I will give you a clue. Think Trump. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've already said it as well on Facebook. Um, USA. That's Correct. That's very correct. So the USA has a canton in the top upper left-hand corner of the flag. So that's well done, boys and girls. All right. So now when you have the canton, the rest of the flag forms what we call the field. If your flag does not have a canton, then the whole surface area of the flag would be the field. If the flag has a canton, then we label the canton separately in the upper left-hand corner, but the rest of the flag now will form the field, and that's the background color of the flag, or as we would call it, the area of the rectangle. All right? It is sometimes also called the ground. So we see it here. We have our canton, USA. All right? Remember, you what we said, USA, the canton, and then the remaining portion, the whole rest of the, the field or the background is called the field or the ground. So that's it. Canton versus the field of ground. If there's no canton, then the entire area will be known as the field or the ground. All right, next two. The flagpole. Now, everybody knows what the flagpole is, all right? That's the object from which the, the flag flies, all right? So the object that supports the flag. It is also called a flagstaff or a mast. And it's important that you know when to use the different terminology. So when the flag is flying outside of a building or on the ground and outdoors, it is called a flag pole. So that's where we mount our Pathfinder flag and our Union Jack when we're in church for investiture, etc. It's a flag pole. However, if you are carrying the flag in a parade, all right, it's called a flag staff. And when the flag is being hoisted on a boat or on a ship, it's called a mast, a flag mast. All right, so know the three terminologies. Outdoors, flag pole. Indoors, or in parade, flag staff. And on a boat or on a ship, it's called a flag mast. All right? So don't be pointed to something, hey, let me the mast, and yeah, 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 it's, it's on a parade. No, 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 no. All right? Mast is strictly for boats or for ships. All right. The next one is the truck. Now, the truck is simply the cap at the top of the flagpole. So, you know, usually have a nice circular ball 
which we'll come to just now. It's called the finial. And below it, you have almost a, a rectangular or square shape that's below it. That is where the holes are that you put the rope through to hoist the flag. So that's what we call the chop. It's the cap at the top of the flagpole to connect the finial, which is the top, to the actual pole. So let's look at it here. So here we see the truck. You see it there? It's, it's a rectangular shape here. All right? And that's where the holes are to be able to connect the rope to hoist the flag. All right? So that's the truck there. And then we have our flagpole, our nice solid flagpole coming down there to make sure it carries the weight of the flag. All right. So I just told you what the finial is. You remember? Let me see. What is it? It's the top. Yes, it's the top. That top ball at the flag of the flagpole, that's the finial. Now, the finial does not really have any purpose. It just looks pretty at the top. All right, so it's a decorative ornament found at the top of the pole. So can anybody guess what we use as the finial when we're hoisting our Pathfinder flag? What do we usually have at the top of our flags, our flagpoles? What do we put at the top? Okay, guys. How many of you all have carried the Pathfinder flag? Huh? What do we put right at the top for our flags? Okay, so um, we've got some answers for you, Auntie. All right, what do they say? <laughs> and um, let's have a look at uh, uh, those guys on Facebook. Just uh, we want to slow down for them as well. Oh, someone is calling it a spear thingy. Okay. <laughs> Not a bad guess. Not well, a bad guess. Um, all right, give it to me, Bello. Spear, and uh, that's all you've had. Okay, somebody has said a knob. A knob? Uh, uh, someone said a point. Someone said a head. Um, yes, we call it the point, the diamond head. All right, the diamond point, the diamond tip, or the diamond head, because it's shaped as a diamond going up, and it has the point at the top. So that is what we will refer to as the finial. It's decorated, but it doesn't really have any purpose. It just looks prettier than having the bare wood. <laughs> All right? So that's the finial. It's also called a staff ornament. So that's what we put at the top of our flagpoles. Then we have what is called the halyard. And the halyard is simply the rope or the cable that we use to hoist or to lower the flag. So that's the rope, the name of the rope, the proper name of it, what we call the rope, is actually the halyard, okay? And finally, we have the fly end. The fly end is the outer end of the flag that flaps in the wind. So that's the part that we see blowing and we feel all proud and patriotic when we see it flapping in the wind. Yes, that's the fly end. That's also the part when the breeze hits it and from the continuous flapping in the wind, it begins to shred and it becomes frayed. So you either have to trim it, cut that end off, or some people discard of the flag altogether. So look, we have it here, the fly end, this part here that flaps in the wind, and then we have the halyard, which is the rope, all right? The rope that we use to be able to hoist the flag. And here we have our finial, which is our staff ornament or decorative part of the flagpole. So boys and girls, those are the parts of a flag, all right? So we learned some new things today. It's not the rope, it's the halyard, all right? A canton, we learned that it's the field or ground. We learned the fly end, it's the hoist by the fly. So keep those things in mind. They're coming up. They're coming up. All right. So we want to move on now to our next requirements. How do we handle the flag? Because as I said before, the flag is not just an ordinary piece of cloth. It's a symbol. All right. So it's something important. So we need to handle it with care. So we have now different times at which we handle the flag. And I'm going to tell you what are the guidelines for handling the flag when we're doing the different activities with them. So, first activity, hoisting the flag. First of all, your national flag must be raised first when flown with other flags. Why? It's the most important one, or it's your national flag, all right? So it's raised first when you're flying with, with other flags. Secondly, it's hoisted quickly. But let me tell you, huh? this, this is a little tricky because it's hoisted quickly, but it cannot reach the top before the anthem ends. So you know usually the national flag is hoisted to the national anthem. 
So you have to kind of keep pulling it up quickly. It shouldn't be stalling along the halyard at all. You must pull it up quickly, but make sure on the last strum of the, item, the anthem is when it actually reaches to the top. All right, so it's hoisted quickly. And most importantly, I suppose it should not touch the ground. So when you're hoisting it, you have to make sure you put it over your shoulder or in the color party, you may have three people. So two other people might hold it while one person is pulling it up. But you have to make sure it does not touch the ground. So that's while hoisting. Now, while lowering, of course, it's raised first, but it's lowered last when flown with other flags. Because again, it must remain in precedence as the most important flag. So it must be up first and it must be stay up for as long as the session is in, in play or everything, the activity is going on, then it comes down. It is lowered ceremoniously. So a lot of countries play the tap sound, day is done, go on the sun, from the hills, from the sea, from the sky, all is well, safely rest. God is nice. So as it's coming out, da, 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 and you see all the soldiers in their uniform and it's coming down and you, you, you know, you put, some people put their hands over their heart, some people stand at attention and, you know, a look of pride on their face. So it's lowered ceremoniously. And again, it should not touch the ground. Moving along, now when flying, the majority of rules for the care and handling of a flag are actually when the flag is flying. So it must be flown in a dignified manner. In other words, you can't just have the flag hanging out your window, flapping all over the place, getting tied up and rolled up and no, 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 it's the national flag. So you must fly it in a dignified manner. You must show it the respect that it is due. All right, it must be in a position of prominence when with other flags. So if you're marching in a procession, then the national flag must be first in line. Or if it is in a circle or a semicircle of flags, then it must be in the center. And usually some will even say on the highest pole. So if it's being flown in a line, then that one should be on the highest pole, the tallest pole. All right. Now, the national flag, I don't know if many of you know, but it could actually be flown in the night. However, you must have a spotlight on it. Okay, you cannot have the flag in the dark. You can't use the flag as a towel or anything like that. No, 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 no. All right, it's to be treated in a dignified manner and that includes illuminating it when it is flown at night. Now, an interesting thing with the UK flag, the Union Jack, is that some people hang the flag upside down. <laughs> yes, I was fascinated to learn this because, and I will tell you just now, when they added all three flags together, that became a little trick. Uh, it's a tricky, I guess, in flying the flag. So some people were not aware of how the flag actually has to be flown. So I will show you a diagram that shows what is the correct way to hoist the union flag. Oh, there, Pastor NJ is showing it to the back of us there. All right. So we hope that Pastor NJ's own is not upside down. Wink, wink. There's, oh. Yeah. So actually, <laughs> you show them and uh, they can mark me and say whether I got it right or wrong. All right, guys. So you heard me <laughs> put you to a challenge. All right. So we're going to mark Pastor NJ out of 10 just now to see whether he flew, he's flying his union flag correctly or not. All right. So when we're flying as well, if you are entering the main entrance of a building, the national flag should be on your left, all right? So it should be to the left of the building or the main entrance when you are facing the building. And the national flag must be flown at half mass. Now, I know you did this as well in your vexillology, vexillology honor. <laughs> I tied down there, all right? So half mass. Now, what is half mass? The flag is usually flown at half mass when what? The nation is in mourning. That's correct. So I'm very sure that we knew that when the nation is in mourning. And how do you fly the flag at half mast? Is it that you put it at half of the flagpole? Do you know, boys and girls, is that true or false? You have to put it at half of the flagpole. Let me see. Is it true or false? What are they saying in the chat there, Pastor NG? Half of the flagpole, yes or no? Well, no, they're just stating some of the conditions for flying it on half mast. And of course, somebody has uh, expressed that uh, my flag is correct, but that's not what you're asking. Uh, but <laughs> the question is, um, 
Uh, is it on half a pole if it's half mass, right? Yes. If you're flying the flag at half mass, does that mean you're putting it up to halfway of, on the pole? Is that true and or false? The main answer we are getting is true or yes, but uh, there is some false as well. Some who have said false. Uh, all right. So all this. who say false, you have it correct. Put your hands together for yourselves. Uh, all right. Uh, so actually, it is not that you fly it at half of the pole. What you have to do, you hoist the flag right up to the top of the flagpole, and then you drop it to the depth of the hoist. So when you fly it to the, to the to put it up right up to the top, and then you measure one of the breadth of the flag and you drop it down to that point so it is not halfway on the pole it is actually dropped to the level of the depth of the flag so it's when you look at where the flag is flying at half mast you should see above the same measurement from where the flag is flying to the actual top of the pole and the same thing is true for when you are lowering the flag you must carry it right back up to the top and then lower it all the way down ceremoniously. So that's how you fly your flag at half mass. Hoisting it straight to the top and then you drop it to the, the depth of the flag. And when you're lowering it, carry it back up to the top and then lower it ceremoniously. All right, so we learned that today. And it's only when, again, the nation is in mourning, all right? Or when, when the government of the day says we are flying the flag at half mass and they would usually state the reason. Now, what I want to tell you, in the UK, only the Union Jack, really, and the other flags are flown at half mass. The Royal Standard, which is the flag of the monarchy, that's the flag that represents the Queen and the Kingdom, that is never flown at half mass. Because what they say is that the monarchy operates in perpetuity, it operates eternally. So it could never be in mourning because the monarch, the kingdom will always be in existence. All right, guys? So I just wanted you to take note of that, all right? The, only the union flag and other flags fly at half mass. So all right. Are any exceptions to that? Only if an instruction is given to fly it at half mass. So for oh, example, okay. who knows if there's, a, if there's a member of the royal family who might pass away, the instruction will be given to fly it at half mass. Otherwise, you do not fly the royal standard at half mass. Okay, right? so you, 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 Auntie, uh, you, uh, I love the reference Auntie Renee. Um, so you referred to the fact that um, you, you keep mentioning this ceremoniously. I wish I could pronounce it in the Trinidadian way. <laughs> Uh, um, so tell us about why you are emphasizing ceremoniously. Yes, th that is because respect has to be shown to the flag, all right? And when the flag is being lowered, it is deemed to be a solemn occasion, okay? Because, you know, the lowering of a flag and the raising of a flag shows a certain degree of independence of a territory. So when you're lowering the flag, all right, it is with the hope that the flag will rise again. And so you have to show the occasion a certain degree of respect, all right? And not just pull down the flag like if you, you can't wait to get this over with because you have to go and eat some burger and fries. That's not how it works, all right? So you pay respect and homage and honor to the national flag as a symbol of your nation. Okay. So all right, Yes, uh, when you mentioned uh, fries there, uh, Pastor Dan uh, smiled. I, I don't know why, but... Um... <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, it's, it's quite late for him. Uh, but um, you, you present um, a very good information there about uh, the ceremonious part. You mentioned the word respecting a flag. So yes. we respect a flag. Is a flag a piece of material? What do you mean respect a flag? Why is it a respect? Because remember, the flag is a symbol of your nation. All right? So when persons see the flag, the people think about the country that it represents, all right? So the flag is, is really a reflection of your independence because remember, it is only when you become an independent country that you get a flag of your own. 
So it's a certain in indication of freedom. It's an indication of independence and, and maturing to the point that you can form your own government and you could conduct your own affairs. So that's why it, it, it shows a symbol of many different things for the country. So the country takes pride in what it has achieved and what it can now do on its own. So that's why respect must be shown to the flag. And it's one of the very first symbols that is recognized of your country around the world. They may not know what your coat of arms look like. They may not know your watchwords or your motto or anything like that, or your national instrument. But your flag is generally the re representation of your country at international activities. So that's why it shows this degree of respect. Thank you. All right. So let's look at this diagram now, guys. Flying the flag. So now we're going to grade past the NJ. So we see, look here, when we see the cross, all right, and I will tell you what that cross is in a little bit, but the cross must line up with the top of the flagpole. It must not, however, go past the flagpole to be along the length of the flag or the fly of the flag. It must line up with the hoist, which is, remember we said this, right? The hoist is the width of the flag. So it must line up that the tip of the cross here must be in line with the top of the flagpole and not in line with the fly or fly, the hoist as we go across here, the length of the flag, I should say. So Pastor NJ, can you show us your flag, please? Come on guys, we're gonna grade Pastor NJ out of 10. Put your grade in there. Did he hoist the flag right side up or upside down? I see he's hiding it. Oh, uh, I first need the grades first. Okay, <laughs> Revelation <laughs> Seminar. There Revelation. So how about, does he get 10 out of 10? Come on, put your grades in the chat there. Pastor, how are they grading you? Eight. Tell us on Facebook as well. How are we grading, Pastor? 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10. What are we saying there? What are we saying? Well, there? I'll let uh, Dan uh, uh, read those ones. Uh, I, can only, I can only, well, I can, you know, there is a lot of 10s. Uh, Lots of tens, yes. And some sixes. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> Pastor Anjay, when we do the when we do the average, you get about eight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So well done, Pastor Anjay. You pass. Our put your hands together for Pastor Anjay. He passes there. He's not flying his flag upside down. All right. Well done, Pastor Anjay. So now we want to look at how we store the flag and how we dispose of the flag. So when we store the flag, the flag is not just to be rolled up in a bundle and put into a plastic bag and shoved in a cupboard like what some of us do our socks, you know, and our chasies. No, we must fold the flag properly. We have to store it in a dry or cool place. It must not be in direct sunlight, neither must it be exposed to too much moisture. Why? Direct sunlight fades the bright color of the flag, and when it is exposed to too much moisture, it has mold and mildew. It causes that to form on the flag. All right? So it has to be stored in a dry, cool place, dry, being the most important word there, and out of direct sunlight to save the color and to save the freshness of the flag. When disposing of the flag, you only dispose of the flag when it is tattered, as in what we spoke about the edges, fraying or, or tearing apart, or when it is faded. Why? Again, who wants to see a dull, washed out flag representing their country? It's not pretty at all. You want nice, bright, and vibrant colors, okay? So when the flag is tattered or fading, you need to dispose of the flag. How do we dispose of it? Generally, most flags are disposed of by burning. Again, because it's a mark of respect, okay? So you want to make sure it's burned the ashes and then some people sprinkle the ashes and all that kind of thing, all right? By, but the Union Jack, a permissible way to dispose of it is by cutting it or tearing it into strips so that it no longer resembles the original flag, all right? And then you discard of it. So this is how we store and dispose of the national flag. Right, now this diagram here shows us how we fold the flag. So I want you to pay attention to it because there are two ways that we fold the Union Jack. This way is for when it's going to be stored. All right, so take note of it. It must come out. So you see there in number one, 
it's fold along, folded along the length. So it comes out like how we see in number two. Then it's folded along the length again. So it turns out how we have it in number three. So we have at the top of number three here, you have that is the hoist where that is what is attached to the flagpole. So you make sure you fold from the other end, which is what again? The fly end. Remember that? The fly end. So you fold in just about six inches and then you begin a triangular fold. So you take this part and you fold it over to meet the edge and then you fold it in and you continue to fold in that triangular fold, just as the diagram shows, until you reach down to the hoist end and then you tuck the hoist end in, into the fold. So it's neatly folded and when you're presenting the flag, you're presenting it neatly folded in a triangular shape and then it is put away in a dry, cool place. I hope we have that boys and girls, all right? Down the length, down the length, down the length, six inches, then we fold in a triangular fold. This is for when we are going to store the flag. However, remember I told you that when you are hoisting the flag, it must not touch the ground. So what members of the Navy do, they do the same thing. Fold it down the length, you see here, to the top here, where, watch my pointer, you see where the rope is going through the hoist end of the flag here, all right? So they fold it down the length, then they fold it again, so it comes out like this, then they fold it up a third, which is about 12 inches, they fold it up a third, and then they roll it. They roll it in, so you see it here, after it's folded by a third in number four, diagram number four, they roll it in, and they just tie the string loosely around it. So what happens is when they pull that up to the top, all right, and they, it, it's tied, they give a quick flick of the rope and the flag opens. Oh my gosh, that looks so good. I love to see it, all right? A quick tug of the rope, and then you just see the, fly, the flag opens up and it, it flies in all its majesty. It looks so pretty. So this is how you fold the flag. You only roll the flag when you are going to hoist it. And that term is called breaking the flag. When they do the quick tug and the flag opens and it flies, that is called breaking the flag. So this is how so the Renee, flag is folded for breaking. Yes, faster. One of the most embarrassing things I have seen is when a flag refuses to break or to be oh, broken. Yes. Yeah, so I agree with you. Happen. It's majestic when it happens, but when it doesn't happen, it's a bit sad. Yes. And I won't say where, uh, but it has happened in life, uh, in my little life, where the flag just would not break. Oh no, yes. Well, you have to, that means you have to keep tugging and tugging and tugging until it opens. Yes, that could be really, really kind of um, sad. Has it happened to you? No, no, it has never happened. I just love, you know, the teachers tie it. Make sure you make sure you tie it slack enough. Sometimes that's because you tie it too tight. Because remember, it's just a loose tie that you're putting around it so that when you tug it, it opens. Um, I have, however, seen other color parties where the flag opened before it reached the top. So they tied it too loose. <laughs> So you have it's to have about a getting the balance, balance right. Yes, okay. you have to get the balance. Not too tight, but not too slack as well. So when it gets up, you tug it and it opens in all its glory. All right, so that's for breaking the flag. So let's go now. True or false? Are you ready? Are your fingers ready? Let's go. Okay, I one. see some signs of people being ready and waiting to go. Let's have it. The national flag should be rolled and put in a drawer for storage. The oh. national flag should be rolled and put in a drawer for storage. True or false? Type it in the chat. Okay, so we are getting some responses here. A flood of responses, as if uh, the hundreds of people here have just... Um, Made that okay. Well, uh, we'll go to uh, what's on our uh, Facebook to be fair. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. False is it overwhelmingly false or is it just uh, one false? <laughs> well, it looks like it's false, and we have some false that is on caps. All false that is like, Why? Wonderful. the answer oh. is 
false, yes. Remember, it is only rolled for breaking. But if you're putting it away for storage, it is folded in a triangular shape. Well done. Well done. That was a trick question. I was wanting to see if you all would pay attention there. All right. Question number two. The national flag should not be flown at night. True or false? Let me see. Let me see. Okay. So we have... Actually, we seem to have both on this one. We've got oh. false, false, true, true, false, at least on the screen I am in now. There's uh, true and false all mixed uh, together. What is Facebook saying? Facebook is saying the same thing, true and false? Well, Facebook is saying, is saying false, 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 I hear. Yes, this answer is also false. Remember I said, if it is being flown at night or in after dark, you need to have a light, a spotlight on it to illuminate it. All right, so it must be illuminated. You can fly it at night, but it must be illuminated with a bright light for it, okay? All right, final question, true or false? On the care and... and handling the flag the national flag should be hoisted quickly but lowered ceremoniously true or false i see pastor dian putting some some symbols there i hope you're not seeing him because i think he's giving you all the answer there <laughs> <laughs> hoisted quickly but lowered ceremoniously is that true or is that false what are they saying there pastor okay bello will let us know what uh, facebook uh, is saying and so far, Bello, the answer is true. Wonderful. Well done. Yes, the answer is true. Hoist it quickly, but it must not reach the top before the end of the anthem. And it's lowered ceremoniously as a mark of respect and honor, a solemn moment to reflect the independence of the country. So well done. Put your hands together, man. You're all doing a real good job. You all are paying attention here. So we want to jump now. This is the last segment for the national flag. And then we're going to jump to the Pathfinder flag, which is our flag, which is what we be proud of. All right. So saluting the national flag. And it says a member who is not in formal uniform, you just stand at attention. You face the flag and you stand at attention. So if we are not in Pathfinder uniform, let's say we are in our B uniform. So in Trinidad and Tobago, we call our B uniform when we have on our jersey and our Pathfinder pants or skirts and socks and shoes. All right? So we wear our district jerseys, our regional jerseys, or our conference jerseys. Okay? So that's our B uniform. So if we're in our B uniform, you just stand at attention and you face the flag. However, uh, oh, let me go with the men first. Men. If you are wearing headwear, you remove your headwear with your right hand and you hold it in your left hand for the duration of the anthem. All right? So that, that's when we're showing respect to the flag. Usually it's during the anthem or when we are praying. Remove your headdress with your right hand. You transmit your left hand and then you go back to the attention position. All right? If you are in uniform, however, and you are passing by the national flag, or the national flag is passing by you, you have to salute. How do we salute? Up. All right, so we're looking at the salute there. So when we're saluting, our fingers must be closed and our hands must be as close to our eyebrows as possible without touching. Our palms must face forward, not down, forward, because a salute is usually, I come in peace, I show respect, and I come in peace. So the palms are facing the person to let them know I have no ill will in my hand. All right? No malice or evil in my hand. So we go up close to the eyebrows as possible. And you want to make sure that your arm forms a nice, proper triangular shape. All right? So it's not like this. No. Bring your arms right up. No, no, don't slouch. Or don't go all up here. All right? A nice triangle. A right angle triangle. So that's how we salute. So you make sure you go up quick and down. All right? So that's how we salute the flag. A member in uniform, when you are marching now past the, the, the national flag, so one is when you're standing, the first one with the salute is when you're standing. But if you are marching past the national flag, you salute the flag with what we call the eyes right position. Your head and eyes flick quickly to the right. 
All right, so you go two, three, over. Quick, quick, quick. All right, and you pass. So that's how you show respect to the national flag. All right, so make sure you know when you're in uniform, when you're not in uniform, gentlemen, you always remove your headdress. When you are passing the national flag in uniform, you salute. Or when you're passing it and you're marching by it, rather, you flick your head and eyes to the right. So let's go with the Pathfinder flag. Look at this beauty. Look at this beauty. Now, what colors do we see jumping out at us there? We have what? White. Uh-huh. We have blue. We have red. We have gold. But we also have some symbols. So we see there a triangle. Not only is it a triangle, but it's upside down. Then we have what? A lovely blue sword going across the center. And we have the shield as well that's down on the center of the flag. So let's learn about the Pathfinder flag. Where did this come from? Well, the Pathfinder flag, it was designed by John Hancock in 1946. Wow, that's before you and I were born. Probably past the end she was born then. <laughs> okay, just kidding. Oh my, did I just hear that right? Did you just say Pastor Dan? Pastor Dan. Oh, you threw it at Pastor Dan. But I can tell you, my mommy was born then, right? My mommy was born when the Pathfinder flag was actually created. John Hancock in 1946. This is John Hancock. He was also a musician. All right. So this is him here um, on his instrument. He would have designed the Pathfinder flag and emblem. Then who saw the first Pathfinder flag? Her name is Helen Hubbs, and she sold it for one of the first camperies that was held in the U.S. in 1948. So two years after the emblem was designed, the first Pathfinder flag was sold, 1948. So let's look at the symbols now. What did John Hancock have in mind when he designed this flag and this symbol? Well, let's look at it. So we have here the blue. Blue means loyalty. We are loyal to God, we are loyal to our parents, and we are loyal to the church. Blue, loyalty. Remember this because a quiz is coming at the end. Let's see who will get all the questions right. Blue is loyalty. Then we have white. Come on, tell me what white means. Everybody knows what white means. Type it in the chat. Everybody knows what white means. It means the same thing all the time. What does white mean? That's correct, purity. Did we get that, Pastor? Did we get that coming out strongly in our answers? Purity, yes. Purity, loud and clear. Lovely, well done, boys and girls. Purity and the righteousness of Jesus Christ being applied to our lives. And we know what? What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It makes us pure within. All right? So let's go again. What are we looking at? There's another color, red. Red means the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He shed his blood for each of us. And that's what makes us pure. So red is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary. All right. So we see it there. And so much red, a lot of red. Okay. So the Pathfinder emblem now we're going on. Gold. Gold is for excellence. We know this, right? Because what is the color when we get, when we get first place? What medal do we get? Gold medal. Yes. So the gold is for excellence. It reminds us as Pathfinders, we must always give our best. Always strive for the highest standard. Always strive to have strong character. Because at the end of the day, you are a reflection of the kingdom of heaven. So gold is about excellence. Give of your best Pathfinders. In whatever you do, make sure you put your best foot forward and look for and shoot for the highest standards. So that's the goal. But we have a triangle. What else do we have three of? What do we think of when we think of a triangle? Hmm, what do we have three of? I know we have the Trinity. Yes, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three in one. The Pathfinder, the Pathfinder emblem has three sides, but it's one triangle, all right? So it's complete. And we also use this to look at the Pathfinder program. What does the Pathfinder program teach us? It teaches us spiritual things. It teaches us physical things like hiking. And it teaches us mental things, all right? When we learn to study and read our word and that kind of thing. 
also to excel. So the tripod of education in the Pathfinder program, mental, physical, and spiritual. So there we have it, our three sides. But let's look inside. What do we see inside? There are two shapes on the inside. What do those shapes mean? There's a shield, like what Goliath came out to King David with, and then there's a sword. What do you think those means, boys and girls? The shield, let's go with the shield first. What does the shield mean? Think about a shield. What does a shield do? When the, the mighty soldiers are going out to war, what does the shield do for them? What are they saying there, Pastor Dian and Pastor NG? Armor of God. The armor of God, all right. To do what? What does it do for us? Protection. Yes, well done, well done. So the shield is the shield of protection. And we say this in Ephesians 6.16. It's a shield of faith wherewith you will be able to withstand all the darts of the wicked. So we have our shield for protection. What's the sword for? Quick, go. One, two, three, type. What's the sword for? Oh, we've got the sword Bible. Wow! Yeah, the sword is the Bible, the Word of God. And Ephesians six seventeen tells us that the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Straight off the bat. Well done. Well done. So you know that you must have your shield to protect yourself, and you must have your sword, the Word of God, in your hands. All right. So the armor and the sword to be able to fight of the enemy. And let me tell you something. Does this look like a normal triangle to you? What's wrong with the triangle? What, 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 what are we seeing? What do we notice about the triangle there? It's upside and down, all right? It's upside and down. Usually the triangle sits on the base, yeah? But our triangle is upside and down and we call this an inverted triangle. It's an inverted triangle. And what does this tell us? It tells us, we must esteem the needs of others above our own. As the Bible says, we must esteem others more highly than we esteem ourselves. Place others above ourselves. And finally, we have here the name of our club. What's the name of our club? We are the Pathfinder. Oh, we are the Pathfinder Strong. Yes! Servants of God are we. So our name is there, nice and strong in our emblem. Wherever we go, people can identify us as the Pathfinder Club of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, isn't that something to make you feel proud about? I mean, True. yeah, I feel proud to be a Pathfinder. I'm a proud Pathfinder. I was a proud adventurer and came right up to the club. And that's how you should feel as well. When you put on your uniform and you have your emblem, you know, you must, yes. I'm a reflection of the church. I'm a young person of the Seventh-day Adventist church, and I'm a reflection. I'm a child of God. So feel proud about being a pathfinder. So yes. let's go. True. I hope you are listening. Here's the quizzy quiz. Here's the quizzy quiz. Blue. Let's match it. Blue, type it. What does blue mean? Match it, match it. Blue to what? Okay. I think even Zara can get this one. <laughs> <laughs> Blue, blue. Okay, blue. so loyalty. What are they saying there? Loyalty. Loyalty, well done, well done. What's the white? Okay, let's go to Facebook for that one, to be fair. All right, what's Facebook telling us? Facebook. 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 <laughs> what do you say, Facebook? What did they say? White, for white. That's for white. For white, yes. Purity. They're saying purity. purity. Well done. Well done. Oh. And we just did the sword and the shield. So come on. These two are easy, easy peasy. Easy peasy. The sword is? We've already got the Bible. All right. The Bible and the shield means? Pro. Okay. Protection. Well, I've already said it. I've read it here. Protection. No, nah, they're on the ball, Pastor. They're just typing away, all right? They're not even yeah, waiting. Yeah, these guys are. All right. Inverted I'm triangle. Ready. Let's see what the inverted triangle, what they have to say about the inverted triangle. Let that be uh, from Facebook. All right, let's write there. Let's see if they get let's it. Let's just wait for it. Wait for drum it. Drum roll, drum roll. Let's hear what Facebook says. Better triangle, according to Facebook, says 
on this day, the Sabbath <laughs> evening, they are going to type the following, and it is that. Okay, I've run out of things to say. Uh, right, uh, I think the guys on Facebook, I think they finished exactly at 5.30. Oh, <laughs> others above yourself. Others above Oh, they've said that. Somebody say that. Who's that? Who's that? Um, Serena. Serena. Oh, Serena well saved done. the well day. Well done, Serena. All right. So we're going to go through our final two or three questions here now, guys. So we're almost at an end. And I love the energy. I love how you all are. We have it there. All right. All our answers coming in. You did. You got them all correct. All right. Protection, the Bible, loyalty, purity, others about yourself. Let's look at the Christian flag. Did you know that we have a Christian flag? That we fly for being a Christian? So it's, now what do you notice about this flag? Does this flag have a canton? Yes, it does. It does. It has a blue canton. And what do we see in the middle of the canton? Right? There's a red cross. And then the back, what, does, what is the field and the ground of the flag? What color is it? Ah, lovely. I'm just checking to make sure you remember your terms. Well done. So we have a blue canton, we have a red cross, and we have a white field or background. What do these mean? Simple. They are, the, the, the Christian flag was designed by two gentlemen. Now, I'm going to try to pronounce this name, okay? But please do not hold it against me if I do not get it right. So it's Charles Overton, and it's Ralph Eugene Diffendorfer. Hey, I got it. 1907. So the Christian flag was designed in 1907. However, in spite of the fact it was designed, it was never officially adopted as the Christian flag until 1942. 30, how much is that? 35 more years before it was actually adopted as the official Christian flag. And as we said, it has a white field, a red Latin cross, that's what it's referred to, and it's a blue canton. What do these things mean? The red cross, it's the blood. Ah, the blood that Jesus shed, amen? And Jesus is our only hope of salvation, boys and girls, our only hope. All right, so that's the red cross. Then we have the blue. Here, interestingly, the blue does not mean loyalty. It actually means baptism. So the blue and the Christian flag represents baptism and, well, the faithfulness or loyalty of Jesus. And finally, white is white. Wherever we go, it represents purity. So there we have it. Red cross representing the blood of Jesus. Blue canton representing, is it loyalty? No, it's not loyalty. Right. It's baptism. And then the white field represents purity. So that's the Christian flag. All right. There we go. <laughs> so guys, let's look at it. How do we put the national flag and the pathfinder flag? Does this look familiar? Does anybody went to Oshkosh? Was anybody at Oshkosh? All right. So the, the, the flags are flown to the right of the campsite. All right, to the right of the campsite. So we have here the US flag, and then we have the flag of the country, and then we have the flag of the county. So in a campsite, it's always to the right of the campus. Let's look at this one on a platform. Hey, this looks like my flag. <laughs> All right, so this is a picture from one of our Pathfinder days here. And on a platform, that red, white, and black flag that you're seeing to the extreme, if you're facing to the left, that's to the right of the speaker. The national flag is on the right of the speaker, or if you're facing it, like how we're facing the screen, it's to the left of the audience, all right? So the right of the speaker or the left of the audience. Next one. On the ground, however, look at these pathfinders here. What ceremony does this look like? Anybody knows what ceremony this is? It's induction. That's our, yes, that's how we have our candles. We light our candles for our low pledge and song. But when it's on the ground, instead of being to the left of the audience, it goes over to the right of the audience. Now remember that. On the platform, 
it's on the left of the audience. But when it's on the lower ground, it's on the right of the audience, okay? So remember that. I don't know, you try to find some little formula. Platform, O, platform, P, L. L for platform and L, left of the audience. On the ground, G, R. Ground, right of the audience. Ah, so that's a trick to remember it by. So you don't mix it up, all right? All right. Then we have on a booth, to, it's also to the right of the booth, okay? Or if you have other flags, again, where is it flown in other flags? Center and forward. And finally, at Pathfinder meetings, it's at the right of the audience. So really and truly, it's only when it's on the platform, boys and girls, that it goes to the left, all right? All the other times, it's to the right. At a campsite, right. On the ground, right. At a fair boot, right. At Pathfinder meetings, right. Platform, P for L, P, L, L, left. All right, so just keep that in mind. All right, it's an easy, easy, easy way to remember it. Now, these are the flags that you fly in the UK. So I have to go look this up, all right? So the Royal Standards, that's the flag for the monarchy. Then you have the Union flag, which is the UK flag. If you're flying it in a, in a, in a, in a, among other flags, the flag of the host country goes first. So as you know, the UK is made up of England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. All right? So you have four territories that form the UK, the United Kingdom. So if we're hosting the event in England, then you put the English flag. If it's in Scotland, you put the Scottish flag. All right? That's after the Union flag. Then if there are other countries, you put their national flags. Then you have the Commonwealth flag. Then you have the U European Union flag. And then you have any other flag with counties or cities or banners or house flags. So guess what, guys? The Pathfinder flag would go last. Oh, shut a tear. You know, because all those other national flags have to go first and ours will be under one of the banners or under the house flags. So let's go back again. Royal Standards, UK flag, flag of the host territory, other national flags, the Commonwealth flag, the European Union flag, and then all other junior flags. Look at this. Quiz time! Hey. Wow. So, let me point it out to you. You have here the Royal Standards. That's the flag of the monarchy. This is the flag of Wales. This is the European Union flag. This is the Commonwealth flag. This is the flag of my country, Trinidad and Tobago. This is the Union Jack or the flag of the UK. And then we have the Pathfinder flag. So guys, we are having our campery in Wales. We are having our campery in Wales. How do we fly the flag? In what order do we fly the flag? Which one is first? Type it, type it, quick, quick, quick. We have two more. Or one more question to go through. Right, before we do our roll call. Which one is first? Well, Auntie, if you allow me to make you just the one question you are doing now, if that's okay with you. Sure. Good, okay, guys. Let's respond to this, uh, which will be the last question. Uh, let's uh, respond to it as uh, we do. So what will be the order of the flags if our company, and we are talking about having a company in Wales, and that's just happening right now. The first oh. e-company is happening in Scotland and Wales. Nice, nice. <laughs> Great. So yeah, what order would it be, guys? Okay, it's any... Dum, 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 dum. Oh, well, it says the second would be Union Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is What's the idea? first? Oh, someone says the Welsh flag would be first. Are you sure? Which flag Okay, is somebody has given us... The Union flag. Listen to this one. Royal, then uh, Royal. Union Jack, then Wales, then Trini, uh -huh. then uh -huh. Commonwealth, then European... Uh -huh. And uh -huh. then Pathfinder. Well done. Well done. That's the order. The Royal, the UK, 
Wales, remember the flag of the territory comes still, all right? Then other national flags, then the Commonwealth, then the European Union, and then the Pathfinder. Well done, well done. Oh, I thought you all might get trouble with that one, but you all are bright, man. That's Pathfinders, all right? They're bright children, okay? So, Pastor, I can go ahead with the other, the other, um, the two final requirements. Or we have to wrap up. I have to wrap up. Uh, yes, I'm afraid we have to wrap up, Auntie. We, yeah, we are way behind now for the next activity. Um, and um, we really appreciate you trying to catch up from the time that you were given. Uh, but allow me to ask you to just wrap up. All right. So but most of these things, and remember, guys, this will be on the website, the union website, and we also have uh, the workbooks that will be on the union website. And so uh, the requirements are well stated there that you have to meet and submit to your club leaders we, before they can allow you to uh, receive this honor. Okay, Auntie is going to wrap up. Yes, so I'm going to just quickly uh, do this last section. Um, the history of the Union flag. So we had the English flag. We see it there with the cross. And then we had the Scottish flag. Of All course. right? Yes. So what happened is that in 1606, the Queen Elizabeth I passed away. And her cousin, King James VI, who was the King of Scotland at the time, he became, he merged England and Scotland into one territory. And so the two flags were merged in 1606. However, in 1801, Ireland joined the Confederacy. So when Ireland joined the Confederacy, their Red Cross, their Red Saltire rather, was joined to the flag. So the flag combined the Red Cross of St. George for England, the White Saltire of St. Andrew for Scotland, and the Red Saltire of St. Patrick to represent Ireland. And that's how we have the current Union flag. So you see the diagram there? The Red Cross of England, the White Saltire of Scotland joined first, and this was in 1666, 1606 rather, and then you added the Red Saltire of Ireland, and that's how we have the current Union flags. So if you're ever wondering, how come the, the UK flag had so many colors and so many symbols? This was why. So as we wrap up, guys and girls, remember, your flag is a representation of wherever you would come from. You belong to the Trans-European Division. And there are 22 countries in the Trans-European Division. And each of them have a flag that represents where they come from. So I just, I'm going to play the flags through for you now. And when you see your flag, I just want you to raise your hand. So you'll see, even though we may belong to different countries, ultimately, we belong to one church. And we need to be proud and always shine forth excellence of the Pathfinder Club. So here they come. They're coming at you. Greece, Finland, Estonia. Oh, I missed out. Croatia, Cyprus, Denmark, Greece, Finland, Estonia. When we have, I see somebody coming in there, Hungary, Ireland, and Latvia. Then we have Lithuania, Netherlands, Poland. When you hear your country, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Slovenia, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. <laughs> Get in there. Montenegro, Serbia. Then we have Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Greenland, and Iceland. And finally, we have Faroe Islands, North Macedonia, and Norway. They are the 22 countries of the Trans-European Division. Feel proud to belong to the Trans-European Division. Feel proud to be a Pathfinder. Feel proud to be a child of the Kingdom of God. Thank you so much, boys and girls. Wow.